In the past year, we have seen how the emergency services deal with a terror attack in hospital. Uh, we've explored black culture and the history and the achievements of black people with black and British, a forgotten history, and black is the new black. I say that every day, Patrick, just so you know. Um, and uh, we've also had the exploits of Essex double glazing showroom in white gold. Now, today is a slightly different format. Uh, Patrick has chosen this format. And so I want you to tell me, Patrick, why have we got your commissioners with us too? Well, thank you, June. I, um, and hello, everyone. I uh, was asked to, to rethink the channel controller session um, in terms of doing it in two halves. And the first half was about the channel, and the second half is about me. Um, and so because BBC Two commissions such a rich range of content from such um, a rich range of um, genres, I thought it was really important to ask some of the great um, commissioners from the genres to talk about particular pieces of content that we're excited by, um, but also to explore how that content comes to television. Because I thought that from the point of view of a producer, understanding how an idea gets on BBC Two, what we're looking for, um, and what the particular genre um, priorities are at that um, at, the, at the moment would be quite a good way of taking the temperature of the channel. Yeah. You know what, guys, you want to find your seats? We did say 10 o'clock, just saying, hashtag. <laughs> so uh, we are joined by uh, Tom McDonald, uh, who is head of Natural and Specialist Factual Commissioning. Claire Sillery, Head of Documentaries, Pinky Chambers, Commissioning Editor for Entertainment, and last but by no means least, uh, Alex Moody, Commissioning Editor of Comedy. Uh, so if you have any questions for Patrick, uh, please do download uh, the Edinburgh TV app um, and type in your questions, and at the end of the session, uh, we'll do some of the Q&As from that as well. So we're gonna start with you first, Tom. Hello. Is that all right? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, a programme that you're particularly proud of. Uh, so we're going to have a look at One Bomb and then let's have a little bit of a chat about it. Great. Great. So who is One Bomb made by and how did the commissioning process begin? So a conversation started between me and an executive producer at Wall to Wall mm. about the fact that some of the richest history content comes from original source material. Mm -hmm. So if you think about series like Who Do You Think You Are, which is also made by Wall to Wall, the idea that you can touch and feel the sort of tangibility in the historical record. And even a series like Back in Time for Dinner, which Alison Kirkham commissioned, started with the food survey. So something where you can sort of hold the document, touch the mm -hmm. document and feel it. And so we started having a conversation about the bomb maps of Britain, which are incredibly detailed, sort of like fine needlework. And from there, it was an executive producer called Kate Hall at Wall to Wall who said, what would happen if you took just individual bombs, a single bomb, and worked out what happened, not just to the people who were directly impacted by the bomb, but what were its consequences, familiar and surprising, yes. across the piece. Yeah. So that first episode, and there are four episodes in the series, takes you from a bomb that doesn't explode, mm. where people are evacuated out of their homes, and eventually gets you to the creation of the NHS. So part of the appeal, certainly for Patrick and I, was how do you tell a familiar story in a way which isn't an expert presenter, mm. sort of presenting from on high, saying this is one depiction of the yeah. Blitz, and people have told yeah. the story of the Blitz before, but how do you make the Blitz feel real and bloody, which sounds like a, weir a, a weird word, but dangerous and frightening and contemporary again. Mm. And what really surprised me, and this wasn't the intention of the series, but that first episode ends up being about the responsibility of the state, especially the responsibility of the state to less well-off people, yeah. to working class people. And where you get to with this film, and, and it doesn't lay it on thick, mm. but where you get to with this film is, is resonances that felt very, very striking, at least to me, because we were in the edit when the Grenfell, Grenfell Tower yeah. happened. Mm -hmm. And when you watch how the state grappled with how you deal with people who are in the midst of tragedy, yeah. Yeah. those resonances are very, very real. So I, I'm proud of it and because- And also how communities learn how to organize. Exactly. Yeah. And actually how to protest yeah. and how to find a voice. Yeah. And so in lots of ways, because of where 
the bombs fell in Britain. This is a way of telling a story of working class Britain because inevitably where mm. the bombs fell mm. tend to be places with high the density of people, yeah. people who were factory workers. So the bombs were strategically placed to fall in certain places. And so it ends up being, I think, an incredible testament to the resilience of the people who lived through the Brit Blitz at ground level. And there's pleasure in seeing their ancestors discover the story of what happened to those people at the time. Yeah. And so also, uh, just at a channel level, that, the ambition of bringing something which had that a level of personal impact, yeah. but connected to the complexity of what happened as a result. Yeah. The story of modern Britain is told by these bombs. They didn't okay. just destroy those lives and impact on those lives. They changed streets, they changed social systems, yeah. and that was something, yeah. that complexity was something that really attracted me when Tom first pitched it. Do you think that one bomb represents for you, Patrick, where the genre is heading, do you think? I don't Is think it it's, an the, I don't think it's, the, it's an example, as, as Tom said, that it's not that we're trying to pull away from um, experts. In fact, mm. you know, Tom will talk in, in, in a second about something that we've recently commissioned, which has got expertise at its heart. But, mm. the, but it's about looking at different forms mm. that engage a broader audience yeah. with historical storytelling, but does it in a way that, that feels today. that you're going to get that emotion of, of the, the, the individual stories, but then also understand that resonance. One bomb is one way of doing it. Yeah. It's not the only, I mean, Tom would, there's a very exciting, you know, we're very excited by a new commission that, um, that Tom will talk about. So uh, I think to, to sort of reiterate what Patrick said, mm. this isn't about saying that we're not gonna work with expert presenters because I think expertise needs to continue to be at the heart of all the specialism. And that's very much history. a format that people associate with BBC Two, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's expertise underpinning mm. one bomb. You know, there are expert voices in the series as well as the voices of people who were affected by the Blitz. But just to talk about another series that we're about to go in production with, which we're calling for now in a very BBC Two, lots of words way, um, Icons, um, the story <laughs> of the 20th century. So Icons is a... Um, an eight part series. So it, it, it's a big, big series for 2019. And the basic premise is that we are going to tell a, 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 what I hope will be a very comprehensive story of the 20th century through the people who made that century. Mm, right. So in each episode, we will, it's divided by theme. So there will be scientists, inventors, politicians, leaders, entertainers, and there'll be three people in each film that we hone in on and focus on, a different presenter for each episode. Yeah. And we'll tell the story of the 20th century through those people. And what I hope, given that we're now in 2017, is that we're in the sort of perfect position to be able to take a long view yeah. on the huge changes that happened over the 20th century, things that we take for granted. And but why they think those innovations are the sort of the most key, important element of that. Exactly, and it's an opportunity for us to use expert voices in multiple ways because each episode will have a different presenter and the series will culminate in a public vote for yeah. who was the most influential figure of the 20th century. Oh, but I hope along the way, what you get is, if you watch it sort of as a box set history series, yeah. what I hope you get is a comprehensive take on that century. So what else are you looking for, Patrick, in Specialist Factual? I think that what you're looking for is the ability to generate that, that variety of voices mm -hmm. so that rather than that's one, per <clears throat> one person telling you, um, <coughs> excuse me, that what you have is the ability to generate <laughs> argument and opinion um, through multiple perspectives. Yep. And that's not to try and make everything feel like a mosaic. It's, a, you know, with icons, I think through the series, you've got this opportunity to get real debate, real argument and passion into history. Um, and for it not just to feel a static thing, which is being described, it's an active thing which created our world. We then respond to it by saying, I yep. think that that was the most important person that, that impacted our lives today, created our lives. So it's about bringing that invention to all of these stories have been told before. How do we get inside them and make them feel alive and emotional, but also bring that complexity to bear? Okay, so which are your favourite icons, both of you? Putting you on the spot. <laughs> question. That's really tricky. The thing is that within each, so across the episodes, so there might, I mean, and, and also it's still work in progress, but yeah. may, one of the episodes at the moment is freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. So who is the person who is the freedom fighter that has impacted the most, the most in yeah. terms of, and working out the criteria, which is, you know, they'll be working with, um, 
Expert institutions, expert institutions all around the UK. Mm. But I hope some of the, I hope it's provocative in the sense that there will be people who are very divisive. You know, we're already talking about would Margaret Thatcher be one of the greatest wow. people of the 20th? You know, but where do you go and what does, it, what does greatest mean? So mm. it's about influence and change and creating change. So I hope what it does is provoke lots of debate and discussion mm. as well. And when does that start? So we're about to go into pre production and it will be on air in 2019. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Pleasure. Uh, so now we move to you, Claire. Hello, Head of Documentaries. Uh, so you've got a clip that you've chosen, Gifted. Yes. So let's have a look at that and then we'll have a little chat. So Claire, how did Gifted come about? So it's a series we're really excited about, I think. It's... Um, being made by Blast Films, mm -hmm. and it's about um, we're going to follow kids who are they're currently aged 12, 13, and we're going to follow them over three years. Oh wow! They've all they've all been identified by their schools as being academically gifted, um, but uh, th and they are also on school meals, yeah. free school meals. Yes. And so it's following them to see. It's about social mobility, really. Mm -hmm. It's seeing how they tackle the challenges yeah. and fulfil their ambitions. And how the system the supports years. them as well. Yeah. yeah. And it came about, really, because uh, Blast pitched it. And we'd been talking for a long time, hadn't we, Patrick, <coughs> about social mobility. And there'd been quite a lot of authored pieces that we'd been talking about in that territory. Mm -hmm. And what we loved about this idea, the minute that Blast talked about it, was giving these kids a voice on BBC2. Yeah. And the personal stories. And the personal stories, yeah. And so how will it work? Will it be every year the show So every year on? we'll have two films. Okay. Um, one with the boys and one with a group of girls from all over the country. Mm. Um, and, then we'll vi and then the two films will go out every year for three years. Brilliant. In fact, I hope maybe it'll even go beyond that. May do. do you think? And it shows the sort of... The, I mean, there's, there's only two films a year, mm -hmm. but the ambition is to explore what... Um, what those three those three crucial years will mean in the lives of these children. children. Yeah. Um, Is it an hour? Yes. Films? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, and also, you know, similar to the point we were making with with one bomb, is that. There were ways people were pitching social mobility as descriptive pieces mm -hmm. that, you know, this is happening. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get inside the story and that you're able to explore what's yeah. really happening in yeah. people's lives through, in, through children's eyes, yeah. then that felt an extraordinarily exciting um, possibility. Yeah. And also how difficult it must be for those particular children to be that gifted in a community where that's not the norm and how you're able to... Yes. Be all that you can be. And the decisions that they are going to face mm. over the next three years are huge. Mm -hmm. And the challenges that they face are huge. And it isn't just about them, it is about the support systems around them, about their teachers, about the influence on their families, their friends. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I think that there are things about it. There are three things that we're always looking for, really, in mm. big doc series. Mm -hmm. Timeliness is critical. You know, it has to be about what's happening now. Right now, yeah. Completely, um, and this has that. Um, it also has to have scale, and this has scale in the sense that we're doing it in a longitudinal way. Yeah. I mean, there's a purer way of doing it, which is that you wait a long time to put this out, mm. but because timeliness is important and we're yeah. talking about it now, mm. it's not about a purity of form. It's mm. about how do we talk to the audience now? How do we bring this to the audience now? And, and the other thing is, is ambition and on BBC Two, I think that means being completely unafraid of complexity, yeah. embracing it, not ironing out the inconvenient bits, uh, tackling big and difficult issues. Brilliant. And it's, it, it's such an exciting time for documentary in that mm. respect because there is so much happening in the world. Yeah. And the <laughs> but the documentary storytelling. One yeah, one can, But it can take you inside stories that, series like Exodus, mm. you know, I know the story, mm. we know the story, or well, we think we know the story, mm. but, but, but documentary can take you inside the story to understand it yeah. in, an, in an incredible way. Brilliant. It's what we found with Hospital as well, yeah. was that it's that, that's something else in terms of ambition, is that these stories are they're very different. You know, Exodus Hospital and Gifted are very, very different approaches mm. um, to, to, to individual stories, and yet each of them has got yeah. a, a framework around them that m makes you understand the world that they're in yeah. and not shying away from the complexity of the world that okay. those individuals operate in is something which I'm really keen to embrace. So how have docs changed recently on BBC Two, Patrick? 
I think a bit in that sense. I think that, again, going back to the point that we made about history, that rather than describing, that you're actually inside the story and mm. that you're trying to see that story from um, a different perspective. You're trying to shift the audience's perspective so that they see the world anew, and that's quite a sort of ambitious or um, ask. But what I think we found in hospital was that it was possible yeah. if you start to say, look, this impacts on this, and if you see this story impact on this story, yeah. and it's happening in your NHS you know, this winter, then you will understand the bigger that. picture. You'll understand the bigger picture, but you'll see it through the lens of the emotion first. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's a really important time for docs. It's a really important time for docs on BBC Two, because I think that, you know, we're really embracing mm. the possibility of the, the, you know, of getting the audience as close as possible Do to what's happening. everything going around. The exactly, moment. and yeah. there's a lot going on. There really is. Uh, so Claire, Marigold Hotel has been a huge success for you, so congratulations on that. Are you still looking for four Formatted. Yeah, it's fantastic the way that the channels are able to work together, actually, mm. that we're able to nurture a series like Marigold on mm. BBC One and then find a huge audience on BBC Two and then yeah. find a huge audience on BBC One. Yeah. Yes, we're still... Who would turn down more Marigold? Uh, <laughs> actually, Marigold on Tour, which was a spin-off show on Two, has also now moved to One. Um, no does that, does that, I mean, Charlotte is here, <coughs> does that get a bit annoying after a while when like you, you work, do you know what I mean, you work so hard, you make, you have your baby, you know, it goes to school, it gets A plus and then someone takes over. And then it gets <laughs> five million views. <laughs> no, it's wonderful, you know, it's about the audience, isn't it? Mm. It's about finding a bigger audience, which is great. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's really good that we can nurture and take risks on too, can we? Mm. Um, the crucial thing with Marigold is that it was commissioned um, as a piece about um, retirement yeah. and, the, and, and, the, and it was a sort of like, will this work, won't it work, um, in terms of engaging with mm. um, the choices that people have got to make when they, when they retire, yeah. but in an aspirational way. Yeah. And then the fact that it got four, four or five million viewers on BBC Even Two better. meant that it's broken out as an entertainment hit, really, so a factual entertainment hit. So it's moved to one, although, you know, it's, I shed a little tear. We will be talking more about that. Um, but not really, you know, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's those things move on and then you commission new pieces. Okay. The, the, the critical thing in pitching those kind of ideas for us, we are looking for light constructs. Mm. Um, it's just what is the question at the heart? It's why? Yeah. Because Marigold had a question. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so please do pitch to us. We would love to find more things. It's okay. that having that, light, that question, but then, uh, as Claire said, that lightness of construct, so it doesn't mean that there's rules, 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 because yeah. the BBC Two audience don't want that. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. OK, Pinky, hi. How are you? Hi. So, Commissioning Editor for Entertainment. Uh, yes. So, you've chosen the MASH report. We're going to have a look at that. Headlines on the hour, Boots puts morning after pill in aisle marked slacks. UK to bend over and get incredible US trade deal. And fertility crisis as human sperm mostly hitting computer monitors. But first, students are in a state of shock tonight after discovering Jeremy Corbyn isn't real. <laughs> it emerged that kindly bearded figure who they believed would come down their chimneys with money for tuition fees <laughs> was actually just made up to get their votes. So I was told that Corbyn comes at the start of every term on a sledge pulled by a socialist reindeer collective. That he wears red, obviously, and if you've been studying hard for your degree, then he brings you money and a jar of homemade jam. <laughs> then last week, I had caught my dad signing a cheque for £9,000. Like, it was them all along, not Corbyn. The Labour Party has since denied starting the Corbyn myth, although it confirmed Tony Blair is real and lives in a drain preying on the innocent. <laughs> That show was commissioned slightly differently because it was put out to tender, wasn't it? 
It was. Um, I think um, Alan Tyler identified that there was a um, something in the ether whereby there were a lot of shows in America, perhaps, that were yeah. doing something that we weren't here in the yeah, UK. Like the Daily Show and yeah, I mean, quite from SNL to all the mm. talk shows and the yeah. Daily Show and, and, and so forth. Um, so we did a tender process, um, which went. It wasn't closed. It went out to anyone who wanted to pitch into it. Mm. Um, we had a number of ideas um, and in the end it was quite a hard whittle because there was a lot of crossover between the ideas right. um, and then obviously we've ended up with the Daily Mash which I think out of all of the ideas pitched felt the freshest, um, offered a very different proposition in terms of a different writing team, the Daily Mash of course. Yeah. Um, and also it had an ensemble cast which um, are pretty much brand new. This is mm. Nish Kumar's um, big show, launch show, and I think that's a really bold and confident thing to be trying. Mm. Um, so it had all the ingredients which felt distinctly different to yeah. everything else that was pitched at the time. Who made this? It was Princess Productions. Oh, it was a princess show. Again, who don't really do satire for us, so that, that in itself felt quite fresh and new as well, to have a different voice. So do you think that co topical comedy is the sort of direction that you're going to be moving more into? Um, I, th I think there's definitely um, a relevance to it. I think, as the point was made earlier, there's so much happening in the world, there's so much news, and yeah. I think in the last two or three years, it's become quite sinister mm. to the point where it feels like the news is satirising itself. And I think um, we can't really ignore that. You know, we have to sort of work with it. Um, especially on a channel like BBC Two, where you expect that layer and that level of intelligence. And, um, and I think for that reason, satire is very important. Yeah. And I think it actually complements the news. Um, in a world where fake news is high on the agenda and you've got all of these media outlets throwing stuff at you left, right and centre, deciding their own news agendas. And obviously, with people with different you know, investments and interests behind it all, and you sort of think you have to take a step back digest what you're being given, repurpose it, put your own spin on it and throw it back at the viewers in a way to sort of say, guys, question this, challenge it, don't just believe what you're told. And um, I think satire and particularly the MASH will do that in a way that makes you think. Um, obviously with entertainment, we want to have a laugh, you know, that's, mm. that's what we do. Yeah. I think it's about, again, making the channel engaged, mm. making the channel engaging and, mm -hmm. and, and plugging the audience into what's happening in the world, but to do it in a way that's got a lightness of touch and that has got a range of different, you know, it's surreal as well as um, satire. And, you know, with, I mean, it's actually Alex in comedy who commissioned Frankie Boyle, but I was very keen, you know, when I saw the Frankie Boyle autopsies in this mm. different um, time of year, but to start thinking Frankie's voice, you know, yeah. and that ensemble that he brought with the autopsies, working with that for BBC Two was something that I was very keen on yeah. because we need those voices that challenge Particularly us. now. We need those voices that take on the sort of the, the big stories and say things that, that shake us out of, you know, what we might be thinking. So I was very keen um, to, to, you know, I think with MASH Report, we've only done four so far, mm. it's, it is coming back. Um, you know, we want to commit to it and let it bed in. It's a new team of writers, as Pinky How said. How has the audience responded to it? It's, um, it's done quite well. It mm -hmm. hasn't done, you know, sort of like storming numbers. What's been extraordinary is the way in which, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very young in terms of the audience that comes to it. And the other thing is that it's... Um, is a younger demographic something that you're looking to sort of have more of on BBC Two? I think it's about, a, you know, a mindset. It's about mm. a BBC Two mindset. I don't mm. think it's about saying, let's chase younger viewers. It's mm. about saying BBC Two is a place for really intelligent debate, mm. for provocative debate, for the most you know, important subjects engaged with in the, with the best storytelling and, and points of view. And that is a mindset. And that is, you know, if you look at sort of the data around Louis Theroux, Louis has got all of those qualities. Yeah. Louis Theroux, you know, uh, he, he brings a very big younger audience, but he also brings, you know, the, an older viewer yeah. as well. And I think that it's trying to develop pieces on BBC Two that have got that, that yeah. BBC Two mindset. It's, you know, it's inquiring, it's curious, it's mischievous, and that's what we need to... Okay. Um, Encourage. So, Pinky, what else is coming up next? Um, well, a lot more mash. Yeah. And I think um, what we're trying to do is um, we, we probably won't be doing any more tenders because I think the general direction of the channel is that we're always looking for topical, timely, zeitgeisty things, um, which has a real purpose to it. So mash has a real purpose to it. Yeah. If you look at other entertainment output on the channel, like Dragon's Den, um, it has a real purpose to it, more in a fat tense sort of space. But... Um, 
I think we're open to new suggestions. And I think um, one of the big things for us is Sunday nights. So if you look at Dragon's Den, which is set in a, a warehouse, if you look at Top Gear, which is set in a hangar, and mm. um, Robot Wars as well, which is set very much in an arena space, um, they're sort of studio entertainment stroke fact tent pieces. It's what can we do in that Sunday night slot that feels like it's moving it on a little bit or, you know, um, appeals... Because it's a male skewing s mm. slot, so obviously we have to take that all into account. But it's looking for that big Sunday night piece, which does the figures of, of these sorts of shows. Yeah. But it's got expertise. All yeah. those shows that Phoenix yeah. mentioned have got real expertise. So again, know, it's about Wars. voices it's, and faces. Yeah, but it's also yeah. about really getting in... Um, getting into the complexity of the subject matter. You know, okay. dragons, they really interrogate those, mm. those pitches and they're, it's the, it's, they're, they're very real situations. And because of that, it has that emotion that really right. impacts on the audience. I, I would also look still in the comedy entertainment space. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at the Fringe for a number of days now and it's nearly broken me. Have you seen but anything you like? I've seen loads. And I think the last few years, there's always been that gap between top level talent and really up and coming new talent. Mm. And I think this year I've seen a real range of performers that are on the cusp, that are ripe and ready to be on TV. And that's really, really exciting. Mm. Um, and a lot of them are telling um, stories, modern stories, satirical stories. And I think we can definitely tap into that a bit more. But what we're not looking for is any more panel shows. Okay. Um, anything that feels like it could have been done five to ten years ago on the channel in that entertainment panel -y sort of quiz sort of space, I think we are looking for something that The Mash has done for us, which, which is a spoof news studio. So yeah. be imaginative, um, rethink what we can do. And also, I think, in a world where everyone is a satirist, yeah. if you've got Twitter, if you've got Facebook, you're likely to have an opinion, and every now and then that might even go viral. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, I think we all just need to up our game a little bit and think, well, how do we embrace technology in the way that MASH has done? Mm -hmm. um, we're we're co-producing, well, we're not co-producing, but we're partnering with the Daily MASH writers. Mm -hmm. um, we're embracing the internet um, rather than fighting it or worse, ignoring it, yeah. you know. You know um, it plays an important role. Absolutely. Particularly for shows like that, MASH. Exactly. And as you can tell from that clip, they're all so clippable and mm. shareable. And I think a real success story to emerge is that we've had millions of hits yeah. with some of these clips. And I think in total, our success rate is over 11 million now. Brilliant. One of them in particular, as of this morning, had 6 million clips. And that was the headline... Northerner terrifies London by saying hello. So, you know, there's, there's, um, very funny clip. It's a very funny clip. And, and I think nurturing and fostering Smiling. those. Yeah. And, and also, I think the important thing about the Daily Mash is that in entertainment, we tend to use the same pool of writers. And that's for a very good reason. It's because it's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, but I think the Mash has got a very different tone and flavour because we're broadening the You've writing team. Teams, yeah. So it's diversity of voice off, you know, off screen, on screen. And I think, you know, for that reason, it's a real, a real success story. Really? And that wasn't an easy relationship to nurture. I know um, Chris Stott in particular, who's the, um, one of the executive producers, has had that relationship with them for over six years. Brilliant. And once pitched it to me in the BAFTA truck, at what, you know, and that, at that time there wasn't a, an appetite for satire. Brilliant. So, you know, I think the zeitgeist is the key and being timely and of the moment is, is, is really the essential thank you, message. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Alex. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm very well. Good. I'm incredibly intimidated by how articulate everyone else has been <laughs> so far. But well, well I'm again. sure you will definitely uh, give them all a run for them. <laughs> Um, uh, so you've chosen Motherland. Yes. Uh, so let's have a look. I have. To say, I've seen this already, and I really laughed. Oh, so, yeah. so let's have a look. <laughs> so tell me about the story behind Motherland. You well, couldn't say no to that, could you? That how point? could you say no to that? It, 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 I suppose everything that we do as a genre in comedy sort of starts with authors, starts with writers. And behind Motherland is this sort of Beatles-like supergroup of uh, Graham and Helen Linehan mm. and Sharon Horgan and Holly Walsh. Mm. Uh, and they, there was a sort of confluence of ideas. I think they were both sort of playing with ideas about uh, the kind of brutal realities of looking after children. Uh, and, and so they, they sort of started to, to work together and talk together and the script came to us last year uh, and was extraordinary because you've just got, a, you know, talk about diversity of voices within one project. You mm. sort of had diversity of style and comedic style and tone. Uh, and so we piloted it last summer as part of a, a season that we do called New On Two, where uh, last year we had four pilots, this year we'll do another three. Uh, which is just, you know, an amazing opportunity for us, really, to put impetus behind projects. 
uh, and it went out last summer. The audience reaction was wonderful, you know, as you'd hope it would be. Mm. Uh, and then it, lovely things happened, like RTS nominations for the writing, and it was it was a fairly easy decision, I think, to go Very to see. Yeah. <laughs> like, right we'll on. have that. <laughs> we'll have some of that. Please. So they've just um, they've just wrapped on the series. Uh, and that's a, a, a clip from the new series, and it's it, oh, it's very exciting. It, it's very exciting to sort of everything does start with writers, and when you have a group of people like that who are together, rock stars, yeah, complete rock stars. But do you think also sometimes that that can be a double-edged sword in that the sort of expectations are so high when you've got such big names? Ah, uh, poss possibly. I think I think it's always about craftsmanship, really, and I think when you have writers of that sort of stature they tend to be you know incredibly practiced mm. crafts people and so when they come together and when there's that almost that sort of lovely tension and there's probably a sense of competition mm. even between mm. the group and I think each other. yeah sort of respectful yeah. and enthusiastic competition and I think actually um I think hopefully it's 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 actually quite inspiring for other other writers to sort of see people working in different ways. Yeah. You know, you've got the powerhouses within that group. You've also got younger writers like Holly Walsh, who has written with Sharon a lot. Mm. Um, but you know, through the process of writing Motherland, we're now piloting Holly's first solo script this okay. summer. So. I think hopefully, it, you know, as well as being the sort of stadium filler, there's also a pipeline in. for new talent. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, Patrick, how important do you think it was to have a show like this, which is, you know, female powerhouse writing team, but also strong female roles in the show itself? I think in terms of the, um, the themes, as Alex says, immediately, I think, would resonate with our audience. But what also... Um, is that they're just, as you say, they're standout roles. And it's, mm. it's not that you think, oh, let's just commission pieces that have got women. Um, women in, mm. But you just think that these are such strong roles. And if you see with, you know, Denise Goff in, you know, this is in drama in, in um, Paula <laughs> and um, Elizabeth Moss in, in Top of the Lake at the moment, there's some extraordinary female roles on BBC Two. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that mm. with Motherland that makes it just feel that you're seeing things from um, a female perspective in the main. And, you know, Diane Morgan as, um, as the friend I mean, is uh, hilarious. And the, uh, the only thing that we have to worry about is making sure we don't schedule it at the same time as the glorious Philomena Kunk, <laughs> who will be returning <laughs> doing her history of Britain. Um, uh, later. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. So now, speaking about people returning, mm -hmm. Partridge is returning, right? Well, wasn't well, that the exciting thing. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. Can we talk he is. about the that? The BBC is in need, <laughs> and who better? Who better at this time of Brexit and <laughs> political unrest? Who? What broadcaster do we need uh, to come make a sense of it all for us? Partridge. Of course. Very exciting. Tell us more. Is that all you're going to tell us? Uh, I. Oh, really? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, completely um, outlining the, the, the full Monty. Okay. Yeah, it's but, not the full Monty, but in yeah. terms of... It's Alan Partridge, yeah. <laughs> but it's happening. Yeah. It's happening. It is happening. Brilliant. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the commissioners. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> for Patrick's fantastic team. Thank you all. Thank you. And now uh, we have a clip uh, of some of the best bits from BBC Two. That's what you've got coming up. Selection, yes. Selection, some very exciting programmes there. So now this is your second year, at Edinburgh. Um, a lot has changed. Your title, your job title has changed in that time. It has. It has. You are now controller. How has that changed your relationship with Charlotte? Is that still the same? No, it's very much, it's, 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 it's very much the same. Mm. When I first got the job, Charlotte wasn't the director of content. And mm. so now that with her new role, as she organised her team, um, she promoted me to be um, controller. And, and it's part of the relationship between BBC Two and BBC Four is that Cassian um, uh, reports to me now in the way that we're trying to sort of make sure that the, the, the two channels work very closely together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, I was start, but when I started the role, as I said last year, um, <laughs> that I was in charge of BBC Two and the Buck stop with me, and it's that's still the case. That's still the case. So, what do you think is the identity of BBC Two? 
I think the, the identity of, of when we're evolving BBC Two towards yeah. um, is to build on all of its great qualities, which are that it's a place, as I've been saying, that embraces complexity, mm. that, that um, celebrates authorship, finds extraordinary voices, um, and has also got a sense of mischief and, mm. a se and, and a sense of curiosity. And I think that the identity of two mm. is something that we're building on, we're evolving, um, and it's about evolving that mindset, which is questioning, curious, all of the content that you've seen today. Um, you know, a piece like abortion, <coughs> where you take a massively charged subject, yeah. But the team at RAW have found a really powerful space where those debates, again, going back to a point I said earlier, you get inside the debate, it's not just described, it's lived, it's real. Um, and I think as a result of that, feels extraordinarily powerful. So for commissioners, do you, would the sort of the, the remit be to them that basically BBC Two wants to be the voice of what's happening right now? Would I think you say it just, the channel needs to be <clears throat> the, the channel at its best is a channel that is alive, mm. is vibrant, um, and some of that is, as you saw with Exodus, engaged with what's happening with the migrant crisis. Mm. You know, it hasn't ended. The stops and mm. the, the, the situation across Europe as people get to host countries is even more complex than it was last year when the first series was made. So it's about, um, it's, there's not one size fits all in terms of what, the, what we're asking for. What we're asking for are those qualities which are intelligent, mm. curious, mischievous, um, and also just uh, fantastically creative. Okay. I mean, Collateral is, episode one of Collateral, David Hare's Collateral, is astonishing, an amazing cast. Amazing cast. Mm. Carrie Mulligan, mm. yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. As was but it engages again with, you, you know, one of the big themes of the age, which is um, illegal migrants mm. and, and, and the way in which the, we as a society are complicit with things that we're criticising. Yep. So let's talk about voices. So Frankie Boyle's coming back. You mentioned that earlier. Um, is he going to be as controversial as ever? Well, he's back. I mean, he's already done four, four shows, which um, but, but, um, have already been on television. <laughs> um, he, um, I mean, he's a, it's not all about Frankie Boyle, but he, Frankie is, as I said earlier, a very strong flavour. Sure audience. is. <laughs> but also I think that he, he's, you know, the, the Frankie in the shows that he did for, as I said, on, for Autopsy, the, his, the iPlayer mm -hmm. um, shows, and then the series that he's recently done for BBC Two, he... It's not about him just as someone who's, you know, throwing fireworks. Mm. It's, it's his level of, of critical analysis yeah. um, and, and, and a, a willingness to take on those sort of power bases that I think is hugely challenging, yeah. but it's, it's important to have voices like that. We need strong voices. BBC Two it can't be a bland channel. No. You know, we're not... BBC One. Yeah. We're not ITV. Not that they're, you're saying BBC One's bland. No, I'm saying that, <laughs> that, that, that well, I'm, I'm finishing my thought is yeah. that so we need to we need to speak up. Yeah. You know we haven't got the airtime of those those big channels. We haven't, well, we've got the airtime. We haven't got the sort of you know the front window of those yeah. big channels. So and we are a big channel, but we're a channel composed of really strong voices. And yeah. Frank is one of them. David yeah. Hare's one of them. Brilliant. Karen and, one of them. And, and you're a channel that really is leading the way in terms of drama. And do you think because you, you don't have as many slots for drama, you sort of have to be really discerning in what you commission? Because you've had some fantastic stuff, you know, the Fall, Peaky Blinders, Land Absolutely. Duty. But I think also that, you know, talking with Piers um, Wenger and his team, it's a really, really, I mean, it's like an extraordinary time for drama globally. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary time for drama in the UK. And BBC Two, five years ago, its dark, thoughtful, complex mm. pieces um, were unique. And now everyone um, is yeah. doing dark, you know, that's yeah. more the mainstream. That's become standard, yeah. And that's because of Netflix, it's because of BBC, we know it's what amazing things that BBC One have been doing. So it means that B for BBC Two needs to be developing um, its own rich range mm. of, um, of, of author drama, yeah. which moves the genre on. Yeah. I mean, we had OJ, um, Ryan Murphy's OJ on the channel, and it's one well, of the BAFTA for Best Acquired um, series. It's an astonishing piece, and talking to peers about what would our factual drama be, mm. you know, like, like um, the um, OJ um, piece. And, um, but then also seeing the fantastic drama that we've had this year, Charles III, mm. you know, a stage play written in verse, 
and an extraordinary piece that took you into the heart of family responsibility yeah. state and you know uh, uh, and, and leadership and um and i thought it was i mean the fact that it, it we can we can make pieces that, that that distinctive on bbc2 with that level of authorship mark bartlett's amazing um authorship is really exciting so you mentioned um netflix what do you think you can learn in from netflix and the amazon primes in terms of drama or what can they learn from you um I mean, obviously, Do you see them as a threat. I mean, of course, you know, Amazon and Netflix mm. are a, a part of the landscape now, yeah. and that people consume them, you know, and there's some extraordinary pieces on there. What what we've got to do is is you know that there's there's a we've got to use the B, the BBC Two as a place where that authorship can you know you don't have to do a twelve part series. Um, collateral is a four-part series mm. that, that you can have series that have got a more focus have got a singular focus boy in the top knot is a, it's a 90 minute single um, so we can innovate in with, with shape and size but what we can also do is that you know we have got a schedule we can put our your, your great dramas in the middle of our schedule and market it around it mm. and that so we're finding that lots and lots of great talents want to work on bbc but you know on, B, on bbc2 um you know people like alan cubert who did the fall are able to do their you know he's developing a new drama for us now develop their very very best but very very particular singular voice so in terms of where you see BBC Two headed? Is there anything you don't want? I think it's just the big message from today is just not bland okay. and not, you know, is, is no is, vanilla. No, is, no, is to try and it's not that everything needs to sort of like shake the trees, mm. and there are other parts of the schedule that are much more, you know, sort of lean back, and they're more about the stuff of everyday life. Family Cooking Showdown is a show which is about the dynamics of family life. It's about mm. the way that generations are held together by cooking cultures, mm. and across the series, it's got you get into lots and lots of different. Um, communities across the UK because you're understanding yeah. the way that food yeah. holds and the generations together. together. Yeah. And um, so that was the reason that we commissioned Family Cooking. That does, a, you know, it, its role within the schedule is to be, it's a bit what is warm, it's mischievous, it's about something to the point that we were making earlier, the purpose is at the heart of it. Mm. Um, so it's always thinking about that sort of, that tone as well as mm. um, the big question. Brilliant. So now let's talk a little bit about diversity. Uh, this is an uh, issue that um, has been in the news a lot in relation to the Beeb, of course. Uh, so let's first of all talk a little bit about your background. Mm. Your story, your personal story is very interesting. Well, it's not that interesting. I mean, it's... Um... I thought it was. <laughs> I want some of your dad's dresses. <laughs> <laughs> My dad would be so um, delighted that we're talking about his dresses. He doesn't wear dresses. No, My he, doesn't, dad... he, sells, he used to sell dresses. <laughs> <laughs> My dad used to supplement his income by running a market store so in my teenage years i was horrifically embarrassed every saturday yeah. standing on a market stall in essex selling dresses there you go that's what i did you didn't know that did you <laughs> no, yeah. i shouldn't have told you that <laughs> <laughs> um so um so, so you went to cambridge but from a working class background originally yeah well, yeah mum and dad definitely um i mean i think that the reason why background is important for me. Well, mm. I mean, obviously it's important for everyone, but mm. when I was a kid, telly was a massively important part of my life. Yep. It wasn't something that I wasn't allowed to do. It was something that I was, you know, that it was part of the family conversation. Mm. And I found out about the world through television. And so it wasn't just, it was a thing which wasn't just about entertainment. It was a hugely exciting way of finding out about the world. So I feel really passionately about the sort of transformative impact that television can have because mm. it certainly was an impact in my life in terms of making me aware of other um, horizons mm. so so yeah so how what do you think can be done in terms of improving diversity for the channel is this something that you're really committed to no completely i mean if you think in terms of socio-economic diversity with pieces like gifted and the other series that um claire's commissioned even one bomb well, one yeah, bomb, absolutely, yeah. takes mm -hmm. you into the heart of working class communities from Tom's um, slate. 
that. So I think there's the so, so representation of, you know, in terms mm. of we need to be putting unrepresented communities on television and mm. exploring the issues that they face and live through. It doesn't all have to be grim. Um, but in terms of broader diversity, I think that there's, there's no other channel that's doing what we're doing. Mm. You know, we've just finished a series um, in conjunction with BBC One and in conjunction with the wider BBC about partition, marking mm. partition, looking at Indian and Pakistani independence, looking at the consequences of that for, um, for, the, for Britain as mm. well. The, um, with Black and British season, the um, Gay Britannia season, you know, we've been doing a number of different seasons that mm. congregate um, <laughs> content around particular moments and say to a broader audience, come and look at this. There's such a variety of experience to explore here. But I think that it's also, you know, we're not there yet. It's yeah. about, as I said, Family Cooking Showdown mm. engages with different families, different communities. If you think about the way in which the talent that we're using in Dragon's Den or in Mash Report that we want, or Gardener's World or Trust Me I'm a Doctor, we want great talents mm. to be part of the of the everyday story of the channel rather than just being seen as in particular moments yeah well one of the things that obviously uh, lenny henry's been doing a lot is campaigning on this area and, and he recently said that in terms of people making programs for the bbc uh, from bme backgrounds it's probably close to 1.5 percent well the thing is we don't know do we and this is why diamond is so important yeah you know and diamond there's a session later today where i think they're going to be reporting or mm. um, it's certainly in, in, in edinburgh and it's essential that as a production community, we all do the paperwork because mm. we don't know who's making the programmes unless people fill in the paperwork and we know what's, who's making the programmes. But we know who's coming through the door to commission. You know who's coming through Surely the door. That but in terms of who are the PDs, who are the APs, mm. who are the... Who are the um, who are the, the next generation mm. that are coming through? Um, the, because if you think about... You know, Simon Frederick, you mentioned Black and British. Simon mm. Frederick's an amazing director. Yeah, you know, black Simon director. Very well, he's brilliant. Um, Mabin um, Anzar, who did mm. um, Muslim Sarah like, mm. um, like Us, which is, you know, to that point of complexity and challenge, was a brilliant piece that won the BAFTA. Mabin and Fatima, the commissioning editor, it wouldn't have been possible to make that series, not because you can't make a series about, um, you know, Muslims mm. in Britain without um, um, Muslims, you know, people who are Muslims making it. But there was a sense of connection, a sense of understanding of the communities mm. that made that series. So, so we need to find that next generation. So are you looking at a pipeline to find this new talent from different, the more thing is diverse there's some, backgrounds? There's some great schemes, mm. but the schemes are all, you know, we have to keep asking the question every time we commission something, who's making this, yeah. who's on the team? Yeah. And we as a, as a whole production community um, need to be responding to, who's coming through the door? If we don't um, encourage people from modern Britain, diverse modern Britain, socio-economically and in terms of ethnicity, to come and make television programmes, then we'll be fixed with, stuck with one particular group of people making those shows and we'll lose the audience. But so it's not just about, it's a it's about who's, you know, we've got to be engaging with who's making those programmes. And also who's on the team commissioning those programmes. Completely. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So let's talk about pay. You know, it's the elephant in the room. We couldn't not mm. discuss it. Um, when the figures were released, it, it was bad. Like, however you're sliced or dice, it wasn't good. So what's being done to address that? Well, it's an extraordinary, well, not extraordinary, it's, an, it's a really um, a concrete commitment mm. to, um, the, to, to, um, to equate gender pay by um, 2020. And how will that be done? I think that you don't want to be doing, I mean, you, I've been is talking... Is that going to be a cut to the men? And an I've been talking the about how BBC Two is evolving. As we evolve and as shows change, mm. then shows change. So we would, it's how we get there. Um, we will get there in 2020, that's what we've said. And how you do it, there'll be a variety of different things across the piece that will change that landscape. So I think, you, you know, Tony Hall has said that in local radio, mm. that commitment was made with a different time scale and it was hit. And so for you, so when programmes come in now, will you actually actively be looking at how much the, st the talent is paid to make sure that it is equal? I think we always, or fair. At, at a genre level, we always explore mm. um, who's getting paid what. And that 
it's not that we're going from a standing start here. There's been extraordinary progress over a number of years. It's not like this has landed and everyone's gone, oh, God. Yeah. That's a so you knew there was a problem mm. and there's work being done. There's a problem in the white broader society. Of I course, mean, yeah. And we've got a tiny little slice of data that is telling us about the very, very highest paid people. What's it telling you? know, Next year, when not just the BBC, but everyone <coughs> will be reporting more at different levels yeah. within their organisation, then we'll see just how massive the issue is across the UK. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what other institutions are going to make the commitment that the BBC has in terms of 2020? Um, so before you, your job was done by a uh, uh, few women. So I want to know, uh, were they being paid more or less? I don't know. It's on, <laughs> it's, it's on the public record. It's on public record. We'll have to check that. Well, Patrick, thank you so much. It's been fantastic thank talking to you. Good luck. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs>